Okay. So now I am recording. We're going to talk about internet architecture. So let's take a moment to think about how amazing the internet is. There's a bunch of wonderful things about it. Uh, number one, it's always on. Number two, it's mostly free. Once you've paid your ISP, your internet service provider, and there's applications like voice over IP, video streaming, you know, Facebook, all of that is free worldwide. It's almost never noticeably congested, even though individual sites or servers might be, right? But the internet as a whole, right? The whole, you know, it's never clogged up. You can send messages anywhere in the world pretty much instantaneously, right? There could be a server on the other side of the world and you want to send it something and it sends something back and blurp, it's like instant. Uh, streaming music and movies, this is pretty recent, right? Like 10 years ago, yeah, you could do it, but it was unusual and mostly uncensored for better or worse, at least in the United States, right? Now, some places worldwide, they have been more or less successful in limiting the type of content that's available, but still there's always the dark web. You can still uh, you know, have ways to access what's out there that you don't want people to see what you're doing. And this, you know, if any of you are somewhat old, you might remember a time pre-internet, right? If you're you know, like 30 or so, you might remember as a little kid, oh yeah, we didn't have internet in the house when I was a little kid. For me, you know, these are all big changes in my lifetime. We went from uh, catalogs and newspapers in the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, right, to suddenly boom, internet. And it's crazy. Changes are very, very big. A lot of stuff is nothing like what it was 30 years ago because of the internet. Anyway, so let's talk. It's moving along. What is going on? There we go. So first thing, the internet was not designed top down by a single company or by a single government organization. It's decentralized. That means no one entity owns it or controls it. There's not some single entity at the top that runs the whole thing. It's basically different companies or different government organizations own different parts of the internet. So the reason why it evolved uh, out of the fact that the internet is a group of networks. And each of those networks evolved separately. So we're gonna jump into paint here to talk about this. I'm gonna draw a really crappy uh, picture of the United States. It looks something like that, right? And there's uh, Florida and I don't know, some other stuff, whatever. Something like that, I guess, is what the United States looks like. You can go with that. And way back when, there was a little cluster of networks, right? That all decided, hey, we're gonna communicate with each other. And there were some other ones, right? Let's say we put one in DC, one in New York, one in Chicago, uh, I don't know, one in the Twin Cities. All right, so this is good enough for now. So initially, the internet grew out of multiple smaller network groups, right? Internet means literally interconnected network. Well, once upon a time, all the networks were isolated, right? Businesses might have initially one computer, right? So let's say in the 50s, orgs that had, uh, that had a computer generally did not have networks, right? They had this big standalone computer that did stuff, but those computers started to be grouped in organizations as networks, right? The business says, hey, we got a bunch of stuff we do and we have multiple computers now. We're gonna connect them together so we can have them work together. Well, next up, by the end of the 60s, some of these networks were starting to be grouped together. And the key thing is this, all these different organizations, different orgs, had different ways for their networks to communicate. Okay? There wasn't one single way to do it. Any of these organizations, they had wide latitude to set up their computers, set up their networks in whatever way worked for them. So, basic question, how do I send one message 
from one machine to another, right? And again, every business can have a different way of doing this. But when you have multiple networks, multiple networks need to agree on a scheme, right? Otherwise, they won't be able to communicate with each other. So within your own organization, sure, you can come up with whatever network addressing scheme you want, whatever communication protocol you want, whatever. You build that up, you work with it, that's great. But when you start setting up connections to outside networks, well, guess what? They've had their own pre-existing scheme too. So in some way, they have to agree on a way to do it. So for example, you might have this organization out here, they speak red, uh, this organization speaks green, this one gets purple, this one gets, I don't know, gray, this one gets yellow, whatever. They all have their different protocols set up. Now, when they connect, in order to connect, They need a common communication language in order to communicate. So they need to adjust their scheme somehow. They need to agree on how they're going to do it so they can mutually communicate. In practice, that means, oh, one of these guys is going to shift from speaking green to red or from red to green. Over time, These accommodations, sorry, I'm puzzling over the two M's. Uh, accommodations lead to a consensus and standards about how to communicate, right? Essentially, when a thousand plus networks all have one way to do things, the next network that joins will pretty much have to follow along, right? Because those thousand networks, they're not going to change everything they're doing just so this one other one can get in. So over time, right, maybe these guys initially started off as yellow and this one started up as red and they all connected. But at some point, when these organizations finally do connect, well, they're going to have to agree and either these ones are going to go yellow or these ones are going to go red, whatever. In the end, it makes sense for everyone to speak more or less the same networking language. I really want to have that thing be black. Let's do it. We're going to preserve the quality of the picture. There we go. Okay. And that's how it grew. Like I said, without any formal mandate from some federal government or global government entity, whatever, that said, you're going to build the internet this way. No, it just built up through a bunch of isolated pockets of networks that over time evolved into a consensus about how to share information. And that's why the internet is the way it is. Okay, so. That's all this. Way back when networks existed, but operated in isolation for particular entities, right? Whether it was some government operation, uh, research facility, uh, military center, business, whatever, they were all their own isolated uh, networks. Over time, these became connected. The first interconnected network happened in 1969, uh, and it's snowballed since then. Now, over time, many alternative networks and protocols were proposed and tried. People had a bunch of different ideas how to do things. But when you, once you have a, you know, a pool of networks all joined together, if a new one joins to that, it's going to use the prevailing protocols. And those protocols eventually become established as standards. Uh, over time, the best standards were identified and adopted in a fairly democratic kind of way. People would say, yeah, this way of doing it seems to work pretty well. Let's go with that. Now, Having said that, if you're in a pool of a thousand networks and you're the new guy trying to join that, even if you have a great idea, those other thousand networks aren't going to turn on a dime to accommodate your scheme for doing things. But what can happen is you mention that as an idea and down the road in the next evolution of the pro protocol, they'll include that feature. They say, oh yeah, this thing that, you know, network thousand and one was doing, that's a great idea. We should include that with the next revision. And that's how it evolved. All right, 
So initially, the internet was funded and created by Advanced Research Projects Agency called ARPA and the Department of Defense for, again, scientific and military communications. That was the big justification for all this federal funding to build the internet. Uh, the internet uses high-speed lines that are called backbones to carry data between distant users and smaller regional and local networks connect to that backbone and that lets anybody anywhere use the network to exchange data with any other user. I'm going to pull this over into paint because paint is our friend. Boom. Okay so backbone we're going to annotate this a little bit right bundles of very high capacity fiber I was going to say FO I'll do it. Fiber optic cable, right? Can send tremendous amounts of data very, very quickly. Each of these has smaller capacity. So, for example, if you are an ordinary user, you connect to your local network, right? Your ISP, your Comcast, or I don't know, Direct TV or whatever, AT&T, whoever, your local network, you connect to them, they give you access to the backbone. Now, some of those organizations, some of those ISPs do have part of the backbone as well, right? So like AT&T, Comcast, they, they both uh, do have some of that. But, you know, many of them just uh, do local network as well. But the point is, if you want to communicate, let me, right. If you want to communicate with someone very nearby, you don't, necessarily have to use the backbone, right? For example, some, whoop, someone on your local area network, right? If you want to send a message to somebody that's on the same local area network as you, that message does not need to go to the backbone, right? It can basically follow from here to here and just be handled very locally. There's no reason for it to go all the way up there. However, Different cases, right, depending on who you're communicating with, you might need to go up through the regional network and back down, or in some cases, again, well, we'll just use green for that, whatever, or you might have to say, communicate through something like this, right? Have to go through the backbone and multiple regional networks to get to the end user. But however you get to them, all of this is structured as a tree so that, all right, so the internet is built as a giant tree so that there's one path between any two users. Although there are typically many redundant and alternate routes available. Okay, but you know, the way it's displayed here, yeah, it's built like a tree. Quite often, as far as capacity permits, it'll be constructed like a tree so that there's only one path available that's actually going to be used between any two users. But in order to provide more reliability in case that path fails, you want to have an alternate backup path available. Okay, so that, that's the idea here. Let's go on a little further. So again, displayed here is a tree, but the internet is a web of interconnected networks with many possible routing paths between two points. Even if part of the infrastructure failed, right, if there was an earthquake that disabled part of the backbone, yeah, you could still get a lot of data through various places, right? So typically anything you're going to do, there's going to be multiple, multiple paths available, but at any one moment in time, only one of those paths is perhaps going to be used. All right. So ordinary end users like you and me, we don't connect directly to the backbone. Instead, we connect through a series of networks starting with internet service providers or ISP. Now, there's three tiers of ISP. So if you remember when we talked about network design, I'm thinking did we talk about that? Well, you should have learned about it in IDS 200 anyway. A tier just means a group of machines doing the same kind of thing, right? So we have tiers here for ISPs. Now, the tier one machines are the really big telecoms like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, the ones you, you know, you think of, oh yeah, those are big telecom companies. Their deal, they own part of the backbone and connect to any other network using peering agreements that are basically free data exchange. We'll talk about more about that in a moment. 
Your tier three providers, those are last mile providers is what they're known as. And the idea is the data comes into some relay station, you know, within a mile or less than a mile from your house. And then they own what back in the day was that string of, you know, copper uh, phone wire that got the signal from that station to your actual house. So they were called last mile providers. Anyway, those ones only use what's called paid transit to exchange data with other networks. The other one, tier two, those are intermediate. So tier two ISPs exist between the tier one and tier three networks, and they have a mix of peering, free data exchange, and transit paid data exchange services. So if they're a big telecom, by definition, it owns part of the backbone and can connect to any other network using a peering agreement, then that's tier one. If it's tier three, they only use paid transit to communicate with other networks. And tier two, use a mix. Now, once upon a time, 20 years ago, these classifications were really, really useful. Now, not so much. I mean, it's still a good idea to know what they are, but it, it's murky. So for example, Comcast used to be tier three. It used to be just an ISP provider that provided that sort of last mile service. Officially, it's a tier two, because it uses a mix, right? Use a mix of peering and uh, paid. But in the United States, where it does almost all of its business, it is practically a tier one. The vast majority of its communications are in fact done using peering agreements. There's just a few oddball cases where it pays. And it does own a little, it owns basically the minimal amount of backbone required to qualify to be a tier one operation. So again, yeah, technically Comcast is tier two, but it, the United States, it feels a lot more like a tier one. All right. So let's, uh, anyway, here's a little uh, thing of the internet composition. So when you draw a tree like this, you have your tier one ISPs at the top and they can all communicate with each other for free. Your tier two ISPs, they provide uh, the connection between the tier three or access ISPs. And down here, these black squares, these are all the end users. So you know, something like this is a fairly typical web of how it goes. And you can see that, for example, to get from this guy on the left to this guy on the right, there are many, many possible paths that could be taken. So again, if one of these systems is really busy or breaks down, yeah, you have an alternate path available. But the way routing generally works is once you establish a routing path between two users, until something gives out on that path, you're just going to keep using it as long as your session is as long as your session is active. All right. Now, peering versus transit. Let's take a minute to talk about that. Here's something to think about as an, as an entry point to the topic. Ever wonder why you only pay the domestic postal service to send an international letter? Well, that's a weird thing, right? You say you write a letter to France, but you only put US postage on it. How does that even work? How does France get the money, right? Because the French Postal Service, they're gonna get it and deliver it with their own country. Shouldn't they get a cut of that? How does that even work? Well, it's based on this simple assumption. If there's a letter going one way, there's probably a, another letter coming back, right? So if you send a letter to your pen pal in France, your pen pal in France is sending a letter back to you. And ultimately, both postal services are gonna more or less break even. And so for operations like that, right, because the cost of monitoring and tracking all that stuff is actually kind of high, it's easier to just worry about the total sum of traffic when necessary than every individual piece of mail, right? They just say, you know what? It's a fairly small fraction of our mail that comes in from overseas. And well, at least for the United States, maybe different in France, but I would still imagine the majority of French mail is delivered, you know, between French localities. But yeah, as long as things don't get too far out of whack, then the two postal services of the two countries say, yeah, okay, it's kind of a wash. We're not going to worry about that. Uh, the only cases it might be in, for example, things like uh, China to the US, right? Obviously, the United States buys a lot of manufactured goods from China that get shipped through the mail without uh, much in the way of mail from the United States to China. So there's an imbalance there. And that's, you know, it is what it is. There's people negotiating how to resolve that. But yeah, when it, when it arises, they work on it. But this is the same thing with peering. So if there's traffic between two tier one networks, they're going to assume that in aggregate, the aggregate uh, data flows in the backbone are gonna balance out. And so they don't charge each other. That's the agreement. But the problem is, again, 
Just like manufactured goods from China to the United States, you have a similar problem with uh, operations that have very heavy download traffic, right? So something like Netflix, that's a huge one. There's very little upload traffic on net Netflix, but there's a whole lot of download traffic. So basically Netflix applications like that, they're putting a big burden on these tier one uh, you know, providers because the directional flow is going one way, but not the other way. Again, you can look at this same kind of thing with Comcast, right? Because a lot of people who have cable through Comcast are also using Netflix. And so even though Comcast is technically a peer one, uh, a tier one operation that can use these peering agreements for free traffic, still the traffic is mostly going downstream. So all the other uh, telecoms basically think, yeah, Comcast is ripping us off. We need to renegotiate these deals, all right? This one's a few, few years old, but it gives you a uh, flavor of what's going on in the discussions. Okay, on the other hand, if you don't have that sort of agreement in place, you gotta pay for it. Right? If you're a smaller provider, you want to send some data to the big ones, you gotta pay them to use their service. That's how that goes. Okay, now, routing traffic. So routing basically means how you get data from one point in the network to another. Ooh, we got a chat, what's happening? Net neutrality, no, I don't really cover net neutrality. That's more of an ethical issue. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention what it is though, since you brought it up. Net neutrality is the idea that any packet anywhere in the network, right, any, any packet of data traffic should be handled identically regardless of its contents or what application it's being used for or what the source and destination are. It is related to that, okay? Now there's been, uh, there've been various initiatives over the years to get rid of net neutrality and there are some legitimate arguments to be made against it but currently it's the state of things that basically yeah if you send data over the internet you can't directly prioritize uh, what uh, how the data gets handled because of the application that it's in or where it's from that sort of thing all right we can talk more about that uh, if you like but yeah there are some people who feel very strongly about net neutrality and you could really end up spending a whole lecture day talking about it because, you know, it's kind of like privacy that way. Most people kind of shrug and say whatever, but there are some advocates on both sides that are very intense. All right. Anyway, so the internet, when we're talking about routing, we mean getting traffic from one network to another. I'm going to, I'm trying to get out of this thing. There we go. What we mean is this, suppose I have a network and you have a network. Now this will be SA lands, local area network A and over here, local area network B. And I wanna get some traffic from here to here. And it's gonna go through a whole bunch of, uh, you know, intermediaries to get there. We don't really necessarily know much about all that, right? But however it gets there, it's gonna get there somehow. Routing is the process of getting data from one network to another, when we talk about that. Okay, usually within a network, it's called switching. Although there are times when they call it routing as well. But when we mean routing, we mean from one network to another over the internet. Okay, don't need that. All right, now, the way it works, typically when you're doing something on the internet, your PC or smartphone or whatever, your client device requests data from a home page, uh, from a host system. So for example, you go to view a web page, you basically initiate a request to that server to deliver you the data to construct that web page. So all of that request is formatted into packets, right? Chunks of data. All of the data you get in response, likewise, formed into packets, chunks of data. So for example, typical packet, typical packet size uh, limited to 1.5 kilobytes. Okay, that's as big as they're gonna get. So a large page with say 
one point, well, let's say 15 meg, megabytes of data, it would take 10,000 packets. Okay? And the idea with packets, we'll talk more about that time permitting, but basically content is divided into packets for more reliable and consistent delivery. If you tried to deliver a large document or other data batch in one shot, what would happen? If it's something failed, a failure would require re-delivering the whole thing, right? So you wouldn't necessarily want to do it that way. It's better in most cases to send it a little bit at a time, and then if anything goes wrong, you don't have to resend the whole thing, particularly because it's not a direct machine-to-machine -machine communication. It goes through all of these intermediate points, and at any point, something could hang up in the process, and then you'd have to you know, deliver it all over again. So in most cases, if it's a large document, you don't want to do that. One out of those 10,000 packets, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that something's going to go wrong somewhere along this path. Okay. Anyway, so, right, transmission across the network, packets travel across multiple networks before being reassembled in their destination. So, when I get this whole pack of uh, packets back from the web page, so this, we'll say this is the client, and this is the web server. Okay, I send out a request, da da da, send me such and such web page. The web server builds that page and then sends it back to me. All of that is going to flow over that same route, right? We construct the route first, and once that's built, then we say, okay, this route is stable. This is what I'm going to use. That's the basis of most of these routing protocols. So, packets typically travel across multiple networks before being reassembled at their destination, and this path of network devices between the client and server is the routing path. Okay, so this is, just make it there. Boom, that is the routing path, right? All of these intermediate networks that's going over. Okay. Now, how are routing paths connected? Well, first of all, there's a whole bunch of different schemes on how to do it. And once upon a time, this was kind of my thing. My dissertation topic actually was around a different way of doing uh, routing. So I can briefly describe that. So around 2006, Professor Uxel, a little bit before actually, had this idea that, hmm, mobile devices are becoming a big thing, right? This was right about before the, iPad, uh, the iPhone came out. So that mobile devices are gonna be a diff big thing. What can we do in terms of applications that are going to be done by a bunch of devices on the ground, right? I mean, we have a standard model that there are towers, and you want to send a message, it goes to the tower, and the tower takes it away to some infrastructure and then brings it, the results back to you. But what about applications directly between people on the ground? For example, vehicular safety, right? You don't want that kind of lag for the transmissions to go to a tower and back up somewhere and come back. It's better to just have the vehicles communicate with each other directly. So anyway, my work on that was to come up with some, uh, basically to implement that idea, as a routing, routing, routing protocol as far as how to schedule transmissions within the network and how to handle how data got transferred from one device to another. So once upon a time, this was kind of my thing, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, so selecting routing paths, uh, I gotta move this window, I can't really see the slides. Each router is gonna switch packets among its local connections, right? So depending on how you're sending the packets, you see this image here, we have one, one went one way, two went another way, three went another way, four clearly went another way, five and then six. They could all be sent over the same path. That's the typical way TCP IP does it for the internet. The source and destination, it builds one path and uses it. There's another protocol called UDP, uh, user datagram protocol, and that sends them out a little differently. They can all go out on potentially separate paths. Anyway, in most cases, we're going to use some variation of the shortest path. We're going to either find a path that has the fewest intermediate, uh, what are called nodes, basically the fewest uh, 
physical devices between them, or it might be a shortest path calculated, not in terms of nodes, but in terms of shortest delay time. Yeah, things like that are typically how it's managed. And the way you do that, each router, right, has some memory where it maintains a table of IP addresses and typically either, typically the next, the next hop on the path. So for example, this device here in the upper left corner, if it's receiving packet six, then this blue circle here knows that, oh, in order to send it to the next waypoint toward the destination, I say hand it off this way, right? If it's six is following the same as five, I'll handle those off the same way. But again, there are a bunch of different routing protocol options and it's way beyond the scope of IDS 313 to cover them. If you wanna become a network guy, you know, you can take some computer science courses in that, that's where they cover that at UIC. Anyway, the key point for us is how damage gets bypassed. So typically you'll have some sort of routing path like what's here on the left, right? You'll have a bunch of nodes that the path goes through and it'll keep reusing that as long as that path is viable. But suppose some piece of hardware in the middle shits itself, right? Uh, the router catches fire, whatever, can't handle traffic anymore. And even the redundant connections around that have broken down. Well, then you have to find an alternate path. So what these devices are going to do, and again, there are different ways that different protocols will recover from these failures. But typically what'll happen is this point here, it'll fail this device that should be sending it to him, there'll be some sort of operation where after every uh, delivery, after every transmission from this, it eventually gets some kind of response back saying, yup, I got it. At some point, if this guy is expecting to get that sort of confirmation, but doesn't, it could either have these two devices could reconstruct the entire path, or this one could have a backup path available, or this one could briefly search for a backup path, there's different ways that it could be set up to recover. But essentially what's gonna happen, there will be backup paths available and this device is gonna find one and it's gonna use it. All right. Now, other thing, internet congestion. Okay, so key things there, packet uh, switching and the TCP IP back off algorithm. We'll talk about those and I think that'll be a good breakpoint for the day. So let me see here. Yeah, it'll be a good breakpoint. Okay, so packet switching, I'm gonna compare it with circuit switching. So once upon a time, way back when, suppose the problem, and we're gonna, we'll move this down a bit. The core problem is how to handle multiple users sharing the system simultaneously, okay? Now with phones, back when, phone services used dedicated lines for each communication pair, right? Each uh, sender and recipient, each, uh, the person at each end of the phone call. This was nice, this was nice in terms of sound quality, but also expensive because users had to share, right? Basically had to rent a long stretch of copper wire for their exclusive, exclusive use during the conversation give you an idea, like circa 1980, a long distance call from, uh, you know, from 100 miles apart could cost around 50 cents per minute. And long, long distance calls were much more expensive than that. Okay, so I remember when I was in fifth grade around that time and there was a friend of mine who was from Canada and he went back to visit his relatives in Toronto at some point. And I was in Rockford, which is where I'm from. And, you know, very long distance call. 
and he called back just to ask me, hey, what's on the, uh, you know, what homework have we gotten? And I, you know, I just, oh, hey, yeah, how you doing? You know, I, did you have, you know, how's Canada? He's like, no, no, I can't talk. You know, it's too expensive. Just tell me what the homework is. And I said, okay. So very expensive back in the day. Reason why, right? This is the circuit switching model. I'm going to cut this and let's move it. And we'll bring it all back up. When you apply that to packets, to packets, right, it would mean that the two users, two user endpoints in the conversation would have exclusive use of their routing path. Right? And that would be, again, high quality, reliable, but very expensive. So high reliability and no risk of losing priority to more important traffic, but quite expensive for the users. Although historically, the telecoms wanted this scheme because they could make more money with it. Now, what eventually took over was something called packet switching. So packet switching, multiple users can share the same routing path because their communication is broken up into packets, right? And this, Here's the capacity much more efficiently because data can be compressed. Right? That's one thing. Uh, conversations often have gaps, right? For example, when one person has a space between words or the other is considering a response, things like that. Yeah, usually even when there's a phone conversation going on, it isn't both people talking wall to wall the entire time. Okay, so packet switching allows sharing this more efficiently. And also, last, provide some options for prioritizing data streams in various ways typically to prioritize real-time applications, right? And this is one of the things with net neutrality, typically to prioritize real-time applications like streaming video or voice over internet as opposed to other applications email, right, where it's not as critical to get the information quickly. Anyway, so packet switching, the net effect of that, easier to manage quality of service, and much cheaper. Although, like I said, you give up some of those issues, right? So the problem with circuit switching, if you have a lot of people on a circuit switch network, they all have to wait. If you have packet switching, you have the opposite, you know, I'll mention that here. Packet switching can handle more users at once than circuit switching. This is why you don't generally get busy signals on the internet, right? Once upon a time, this is a common thing on the phone. You try to call somebody and they weren't available and you get the busy signal, right? Well, what are you gonna do? That's not good on the internet, right? You wanna access a web server, you ought to be able to do it. So packet switching allows that. Uh, packet switching can handle more users at once than circuit switching, often by you know, prioritizing or compressing data or otherwise 
by varying quality of service. You can do that. You have that option where you don't really have that for circuit switching. Okay. One more thing. So that's packet switching versus circuit switching. You don't need to know those in painful detail, but hopefully the core idea makes sense. The other thing I want to talk about, this is absolutely an extra. What I'm about to give you right now is pure extra, will not be referenced on the exam in any way. However, I want to give it to you ahead of Thanksgiving. So we have a concept called binary exponential back off or BEB. Okay. Now, many of you are going to go home for Thanksgiving and you may, you know, virtually or in real life communicate with your grandparents. And one of the things they're going to ask you is, hey, Joe, what are you learning at UIC? Right? They're going to they're ask you that. It's going to come up. And it's nice if you have something impressive, especially if they're helping pay for your education, right? So you want to have a good answer to this question. And binary exponential back off is an excellent answer. You will be able to say, oh, sure, we've just learned about the binary exponential backoff algorithm. And in most cases, that will totally intimidate your grandparents. And they'll say, wow, that sounds complicated. Great. Keep on doing what you're doing. Okay. But on the off chance that somebody asks, oh, that sounds interesting. What is the binary back exponential back off algorithm? Well, here's what we have. All right. So imagine, for starters, We have three devices, okay? And they're all connected somehow. They're in mutual communication uh, for whatever reason. This works best with wireless, all right? It's easiest to discuss in wireless devices. So we have three wireless devices, A, B, and R. R for receiver. Okay, I'm gonna label them here. Okay, and A and B are both trying to communicate with R. I'm gonna move R up a bit. Okay. So when A tries to send a message, send a packet to R, R can only receive the packet if it's not already handling a data stream from B. So if R is available, R will accept the packet from A. If R is available, it accepts A's packet. If not, then A must try again later, right? That's the back off. Is you back off and you try again a little later. Now, there are many different ways you could schedule this, but in BEB, the back off time doubles between failed transmissions, failed transmission attempts. Basically, after each failed attempt, the back off delay doubles, right? Thus, it's binary exponential. It increases by a power of two each time. And this reasonably quickly converges to a reasonably appropriate delay for the total pool of network activity. Right, that's the logic behind this. It's not perfect. You can find cases where it's suboptimal, but 
if there are a fairly large pool of devices and they're all trying to take turns communicating with various ones of each other, you need some way for the devices to take turns. Otherwise, it'll all just, all the communications will interfere with each other. They'll become scrambled gibberish. So binary exponential backoff allows a reasonably good way for many devices to schedule their transmissions without too many collisions between those transmissions. Okay, that's all it is. So when you're having Thanksgiving and grandma and grandpa there are sitting down for a slice of turkey or tofurkey or whatever, you can say binary exponential back off algorithm. That's what we learned. Okay. So this is a good break point. So I'm gonna stop the lecture. So now we're stopping the sharing, we're stopping the